All right, here we go. And then, did somebody enable annotations? Well, if uh, somebody sees to do that. So the, the first thing I wanted to address is just the nature of the, the pull request that you initiated, Gary. Um, and I wanted to double check. There were two issues that you opened and I think your PR solved them both, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I believe so. I noticed that, um, well, as I was building the Docker containers, because, you know, build and test locally, at least before you try to push it, right? Yeah. I saw that um, the Python pip dependency didn't work uh, well. Um, and so I patched it to be the dev dependency, hoping that one of the linking libraries that was throwing a fit would be included in the dev version, and it was. So okay. that feels like it probably fixed the issue, but I don't want to cause other problems elsewhere. Yeah, let me, um, let me just take a look at this, because I had to, um, let's see. I had to resolve a conflict when I right. to do it. And I just want to make sure that the conflict I resolved didn't break anything. Is this the entirety of what you expect to have changed? Or was there more? Uh, there was another file that I edited, but I assume that if it's in dev, that it's not a big deal. I see you're measuring it against dev. Uh, if yeah, the dev I... branch has the new dependency, then everything should be fine. But otherwise, there is a problem that I mentioned in the conversation. All right. Um, let's. It's it's. Which file is that in? Um, I think it's set up pi. I think that's where the dependencies are declared. Yep. Okay. Well, I guess uh, run it, and if I screwed it up, I apologize, and <laughs> I will. Uh, we'll we'll fix yeah, it. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do another patch. I I can take a look, but I I'm pretty sure that it's. I assume it's just something that you mentioned in your dev branch as well. Yeah. So um, just on the getting dev into main we've essentially we've gone longer than we have in years between main releases and that's i mean largely because we've been fixing a bunch of things in dev and um we we're ready to we're getting ready to merge it but there's a couple of other things we're trying to get in and then we're gonna take a different we're gonna use a different strategy that the team laid out going forward um historically we've run everything through dev first but now for changes like you made, Gary, um, we're just going to take those PRs straight into main and reconcile with our development cycle later. So patches that fix things that are broken are just going to go straight to main, um, which isn't Sweet. how we did it before. Um, it just slightly changes our backend testing uh, cycle um, so that everybody knows the way we we do all the, the unit tests that we have. We, we run the install. We, we do a bunch of testing. But then to make sure that everything works, I also run a full collection and add repositories to make sure that everything actually works from beginning to end, that nothing from a data collection standpoint that you can't see when reconciling code gets broken. Um, and that that can happen from time to time. Like uh, I recently had an issue with RabbitMQ and its version okay. update required a different version of Flower. And so some weird things broke. So okay. that's how we find these kinds of issues. Are you having any, Gary, just to finish up on the Docker thing, um, are you having any difficulty um, getting the Docker container to run then? Because from the, from our testing, we're still struggling with an issue with uh, RabbitMQ's container. Yeah, that was something that I was going to, wait for your input on because i know that you mentioned you were going to introduce rabbit as a container uh dependency and i don't want to stand it up myself if i can do that with the container so i haven't um tried it in earnest to like run it outside of what's available right now in the docker compose config all right um and i'm, I'm pulling it up now to try what's the change that you mentioned in docker compose okay i'm going to ask john and isaac to um take a look at that uh in the next week and that will be an action item for them 
we, we've been pretty close on it. And uh, James Kunstel from 8Nut gave us some pretty good advice on, on how to do it. We were having trouble importing the config because the standard container doesn't really make that easy. But we think we can actually just mount a mount a file system like you've done for Postgres, and that should solve that. Um, any other discussion on Docker stuff? And feel free, by the way, to add anything that you want to the agenda. So my video died for a second there. Um, you you mentioned that uh, people were working on the config, and there was an issue with the standard container. Yeah, the standard container on Docker Hub for RabbitMQ doesn't provide clear instructions for how to import a custom config into the container, which all of our other containers like Postgres and uh, the one we use for Augur, the one we use for Redis, they all do. Um, so it's, we just have to figure out that anomaly. And I wouldn't say that anybody currently on the team is a Docker expert. So James Kunstel from 8 Not is helping us out with that. Okay, cool. If, if you want some more support, I've played enough with Docker that I could probably mash something together. Um, I just don't know enough about Augur to know if I'm doing it right. <laughs> I mean, basically, Augur just needs a, a an instance of RabbitMQ to, to run the queue through. So it's not, the dependency is not more complicated than that. Is is the config like available in the repo actually? Yeah. Or is it okay? Yeah, the config that we use is available. Um, I believe it's in the setup instructions. There's basically just one one change to the standard. Well, there's two changes. Um I can double check that. I'll verify the documentation, Gary. Okay. Uh, well, that gives me something to go on. I can probably make time this week uh, to look at it because this is like something I really want to get done uh, before Q1 is over and I have other stuff that I can work on. So I right. would, uh, I'll take a swing at it. If it winds up being too much, then I'll, I don't know, post in Slack and let you know. I think for somebody who spends a decent amount of time or any amount of time in Docker on a regular basis, it's probably not as much to figure out as for us. We, we, touch docker when we have to and then we don't touch it for years so how do i get that i have uh i i feel that way about databases i use databases as uh, necessary evils but i don't really like touching them yeah understood um the next item i put up on the agenda is that um we'd like to so for the eight knot front end and I welcome input on how to think about this. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, this is what the eight knot front end looks like. And I might need to make this look just a little bit wider. Um, and then the default group is chaos. And if you go under contributions, you you get data that comes up like this. And I think some of the some of the feedback we've gotten is that people want to navigate to groups of things and look at them together. And this, this is extremely useful, but maybe doesn't provide all of the insights that people want. So I'm, I'm interested in what kinds of setup for this. I mean, I have my own ideas, but I'm interested in when you come to look at data like this, since we have a giant amount of data ready to use, what, what's missing in terms of how to make this a more useful public instance for the community. And maybe this isn't a one meeting question, but something to ponder. Well, as we're pondering, um, I can say that something that is a shock for me between using Grimoire and Augur, for example, is that like the uh, open search interface, even not, not just Elk feels pretty like uh, familiar. That doesn't make it right. Um, but maybe some inspiration could be pulled from like how that interface queries and how we can use that. Uh, I know that 8 not is is not open search. So that's kind of like saying, oh, well, you know, it's not quite like a horse when you're showing me a car. But do you have, I, an, example, I just... do you have an example that you could share, Gary? An example of... Uh, like just uh, the elk stack that you use with Grimoire that 
Dude. Oh, sure. Um, this is tough now because I know that they've changed the repo pretty dramatically. And so the one that ships with it by default is open search. But I remember in my glory days of using um, Grimoire like well before that happened when everything was uh, breezy that yeah. I could spin up Grimoire and have like a whole suite of things available. Uh, and then I could kind of poke at them and like change the configuration around on the dashboards that were already presented to me. So that like basically requires that there's a querying language that each of these dashboards is available through that querying language. And then you can change the dashboards like relatively easily all within that interface, which I understand to be a very, very big ask. But if you're talking about like, you know, philosophically, what could this use? Um, being able to edit um, those panels in that way was something that got me more interested in using um, uh, Grimoire and could be something for Augur. Yeah, I just sent you a link, a link in the chat. Oh, thanks, Don. Yeah. Um, oh, Baturge. I, I almost had it right. Yeah, that's kind of confusing. But I think it's these filters along the top, right? Is that Gary? That is that kind of what you were talking about? Yeah, there's the fact that you can filter everything on the panels through that standard like search bar. There's the fact that each of these panels is itself an editable resource. So it's just like a very configurable interface when I need to like curate a view for something that I want. Um, that being said, like since I haven't set up Augur and I haven't had a not running on top of Augur uh, for like my own, um, you know, I th there's some things that I can't publish onto, or I, I say publish, there's some things that I can't curate in a view that isn't controlled by Verizon infrastructure. And so I will give more feedback more directly about the eight not interface as I like actually get to play with it. But I'm seeing what eight not is now and having poked at it, it feels like maybe that's something that that we could aspire to. But also it's a different product. I don't know. I'm just going to uh Given no, thoughts here. I mean, I, I think so. I think when um, I look at this, so one of the things we're looking just at chaos data. So the chaos.baturge.io has mm -hmm. only chaos repositories. And one difference with this is there are like 80,000 repositories in here. It starts with chaos. Right. Um, and we could do an add filter. So effectively, effectively, it would what you're suggesting is we have this GitHub bot filter, right? Yeah. So that's on by default. That's the same as not bots, um, not empty commits. I don't actually think we count empty commits at all. Um, but I'd have but to these, are, these are just defaults. So don't get hung up on the fact that this happens to be a chaos dashboard. So right. for example, when I worked at VMware, we had CNCF projects loaded into our instance. We had stuff from you know the VMware orgs. We had a whole bunch of stuff. So it was more like what you have in Augur but we had it all loaded into Grimoire Lab, and uh -huh. then and then we could filter it based on what Gary was saying. So don't get hung up on what it has and the filters that it defaults to. Okay. But I think the point is that you can filter by a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, and I, I think that basically boils down to allowing whatever querier or querying language, if you want to get like real into it, just allowing that to pick fields specifically. Um, I think that is more of a win than being able to curate the panels and configure the panels super well. Um, if you're looking for like direction of which one of those things is more important. Yeah. Uh, it's just like very helpful to answer questions that happen um, like on the fly. Like I'll have folks within my organization that will ask, oh yeah, well, you know, how big of a problem is this heart bleed vulnerability really? Or like whatever the new big hotness, you know, log4j or whatever just happened with struts like just being able to answer that question pretty quickly and with a pointed like only filter for this usage is going to be like a big change for me it's something i already do with the data that we have and it would be something that would be super cool to do with auger and anon are there filters that come to mind i'm going to paste something and it shouldn't hopefully it won't be too ugly um uh i mean i can describe it generically as <laughs> filters that filter on fields 
within the data. Okay. Are you often filtering on projects, people, time? Uh, we focus a lot on the components, the like actual projects. Yeah. So those, uh, when you say components, do you mean dependencies, for example? Yeah. So uh, it could be a number of those fields that you might identify a component with. You might identify it by the name that comes from the package manager. You might find it by the URL of the Git repository. I think I think that that would be incredibly difficult to do given the the way that eight knot and augur are, are are structured. Oh, okay. Um, but I think Gary's point is that it doesn't matter what he wants to filter on, he can filter on it because that's kind of the way open search is designed to work. So you can literally filter on any of these database fields um, that are in the basically anything in the database, you can filter on it using some of these these ad filters. Because you can see all the fields are listed in here. Um, and because it's kind of pointy clicky, so it's like, uh, so if you click on any one of these, you'll see that it's, um, so like, uh, yeah, you can is, is not, you've got options for, for that plus values. So but I think given, given that the way that eight knot generates the graphs, it basically, they make specific database queries. And I, mm -hmm. I don't know how easy that would be to change those on the fly. Yeah, they'd be changing the, the queries are effectively populating a cache and then it would be making, and I would have to have an eight knot person and they're both on, uh, both um, James and Callie are uh, out today. So they won't, they're not gonna be able to be here, but I'd have to have them tell me, my, my understanding from poking around with eight knot is, there's certainly more that can be done, but it's definitely not like there's a trade off for the scalability of the number of repos you get with Augur, perhaps with the yeah. functionality that you're seeing here. But we are caching a good deal in the eight knot side. So I am less familiar with those capabilities. Uh, and I think for that, I might suggest that I have Kelly address it. Um, in the next uh, meeting. Yeah, and um, I think this this like line of thinking will be more relevant when I get an instance running and I'm tracking repos on repos on repos because then I can see whether or not the the use case I have right now with uh, viability is is basically if we inter or one of the use cases is if we introduce this other thing that people might want to use. Is it above the 50th percentile? Is it below the 50th percentile? Is it something that I'm making the uh, like overall system actively worse by integrating or better by integrating? And so that's like something that I'm going to be thinking about and probably forming some tools and a use case around as I get this data and see what I can do with it, uh, with that interface. Yeah, and historically, I think the way that most of us have done this is that we've we've done some um, so rather than creating some of the filters in the interface itself is um, generally we've written database queries that um, mm -hmm. get the data that we want and visualize it in in a way that makes sense for for our users. So that that's how I did it from a from a VMware perspective. So that's it's a good way to do it if you're um, if you have some common things that you're always wanting to filter on and um, uh, and then you can, you know, you can change them. And, you know, some of us, so in the past, I think a lot of people have used Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I've tended to favor scripts just because I like to run stuff, just kick it off and let it go. Yeah. Uh, but but there is some of that option as well. But but I do agree with Sean, maybe we should um, bring this up again when we have James and Callie, because there might be some dash plotly ways of doing this that we're just not familiar with. Yeah, totally. And yeah. Uh, to your point about like scripting in Jupyter Notebooks, honestly, or just like to give some transparency into how I think I would actually handle that. Um, we have the privilege of being able to use BigQuery. So I can port all of this data into like BigQuery and do a lot of the optimizations that you get for free with that product. 
um that might be something that i i investigate if we start seeing look because obviously auger can collect this data a lot better than i can with mm -hmm. whatever knowledge i have so yeah totally if you do that i'd be interested to hear your experiences because i don't know i don't know if i've heard of anybody doing that um so yeah so i'm curious yeah i can definitely write up um generic uh impressions of like oh yeah i used this data and transformed it a little like looking like this and now look at this graph without labels i, <laughs> I don't have any labels on any of the projects or i guess for some of them i could well yeah now i'm getting into asking my communications team <laughs> <laughs> no I've, I've stripped the labels off lots of my graphs to show them um just i, I don't like to incriminate projects right well, especially when i'm yeah. giving the example of maybe don't do this yeah uh, yeah it's, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody you know yeah. confidentiality aside yeah, whenever we've done, we've used Augur Jupyter Notebooks to do like competitive analysis in different spaces and open source. And we've always obfuscated the project that is all the projects that are not the project that's wanting the, the report, right? Like mm -hmm. always, it's it's hidden from any slides. The project owner may know which, how the other, which other projects are which, but any slides that have been presented have obfuscated the other projects. Yeah. Both both for uh, confidentiality and and uh, you know being nice because it does feel really yeah. bad to stomp on somebody who this is your project and it's like your fun thing that you get to do sometimes and oh no it has poor governance like that doesn't feel it feels like punching down yep yeah agreed so um the next the next thing I wanted to t just mention is. I'm going to load the CNCF projects into our public dashboard instance. And before I did that, I'm curious when, when, when you're looking at CNCF projects, do, cause the list that I get is the, it's the org slash repo. So it's like Kubernetes, Kubernetes. Um, but of course the, the org has many more repos. So, when people are thinking about metrics for these CNCF projects, are they thinking about the whole org or are they just really thinking about that one repo or do they want to see packages of both views? I can say, so uh, I am a co-chair of a CNCF uh, uh, technical advisor group. So I do actually spend a fair bit of time in dev stats. Um, and the way that people tend to look at uh, dev stats is, um, by so they have a group by project so dev stats because it's cncf specific can do some pretty sophisticated things where it says these are all of the kubernetes repositories right and here they are broken into groups so that you can filter it based on what you're looking for okay. so it loads um dev stats loads all of the repositories from all of the cncf projects and then um and some of those are spread like kubernetes spread across multiple orgs and um, and then it kind of breaks it down by by groups of of logic logical ways of of looking at these projects um, because it's a CNCF tool they can they can do that. Bye, Gary. Um, here's here's what I will caution you against: um, the volume um, associated with all of the CNCF projects together is um, is crippling. So the reason the DevStats exists as a separate okay. project is because um, I don't know how much you know about the way DevStats works, but it basically, I think uh, it no, uses- Pretty fancy. It has one- It doesn't thing. use the GitHub API. It uses yeah. the, whatever the fire hose is called, and okay. then discards everything that's not a CNCF project because it's easier to do it that way because the volume is so incredibly massive. Okay. Um, so- my concern would be that if you try to load all of that mm -hmm. into this instance, you may cripple the instance. Uh, okay. I would talk to Josh Burkus before you do this. Good idea. <laughs> because Josh understands the scalability issues in a way that I, I do not. Um, but yeah, so DevStats was designed specifically to um, to run at scale. For, for these particular types of projects. Um, because I do know that they loaded um, them into Grimoire Lab and there were some, some issues with running certain types of updates and keeping the data up to date in certain in certain ways. That makes sense. So. That makes sense. Um, 
Thanks. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Um, for the status of public collection, I just wanted to throw out there that we have this uh, our flower instance. So you, it's very technical, but if something doesn't look right, you can see if the collection process is failing. Um, we do have a notifier on now that will tell us when the site is down, but it won't always tell us if collection's failing. So if something seems like it's not getting updated fast enough, you can always check here. Um, and basically the, the critical signal would be if any of these statuses are not online, that would suggest that a collection process has died. And um, the last thing, one of the last, one thing I want to bring from, if there are any questions on that, from the Augur afternoon session at Chaos Con, was that, that was two weeks ago, right? Feels like last week, but I guess it was almost two weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> we, we talked about multi-tenancy a good deal, and there's a growing request for wanting instances of Augur that can mine data or can pull data from public GitHub as well as enterprise GitHub. And you could insert GitLab in there and, and have the same scenarios or questions. So that's something that um, we've kind of designed in our heads how we would do it, which would effectively, and I talked a little bit with um, Santi from Biturgia because they have this challenge as well. Um, that they've resolved. And it's kind of the solution we have in mind is similar to what Baturgia does, which is we would have a pool of tokens that are for the enterprise in instance and a pool for public. And we would simply have to designate um, where a repository lived uh, in a category. So it, it's not that hard, but it's a little bit of technical work um, to implement. And so that's kind of on the roadmap right now. And then uh, finally, any other items that people want to add to the roadmap or discuss regarding Augur while we're all here? If not, I'm happy to release you. Um, Doreen, I, I know, are, I can't remember, are you the person I was communicating in Slack with about getting started working with Augur? Yes, um, the one who wanted to join, I've always wanted to join to start working, contribute. Though I haven't been getting, the meetings have been confusing, now it's the first meeting, at least today. Yeah. yeah, we changed it right before ChaosCon, and then I missed I missed the meeting the week after ChaosCon last week because I my train got delayed. So here we are. Okay. So have we just started or it's we, over? Um, well, I, I think the agenda is over, but when it comes to getting started with Augur, probably would be helpful for us to know um, if, if uh, you've been able to look at issues or if uh, the documentation helps you understand how to start contributing or if there are some blind spots or blank spaces that need to be filled in for you, for a newcomer like yourself to get rolling. It's a chance for us to learn. Yes. Uh, like uh, now I need to know uh, the documentation. I need to go through it. I need to look at the issues and then I need to know you, what stack are you using or it's open. Which stack are you using? Obviously, there's oh, a stack. Oh, it's uh, using the, the technical stack? Yes. So the Augur technical stack is a Python application. It's called, uh, the application framework is called Flask. And so all of Augur uh, exists in the Flask framework in Python. The uh, 8 knot is a dash plotly framework that's really focused on presenting the data. Uh, it's a slightly different stack. Oh, you are. You're doing data visualization also. Yeah. That's, yeah. Nice. So that's what the dash plotly stack is. And that's at the, um, the dash plotly is, um, I'll just make a note here. Uh,
I'm listening. Uh, I'm uh, I'm typing in the page. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, dash plotly eight not for yeah. So not. that's um, and then uh, aug uh, let's see, flask is auger, and that's. So um, the dash, so the, the nice thing about the dash plotly framework eight knot is it is pretty easy to fire it up and and play with it. And if you wanted to do that, I could certainly uh, help you there. Uh, if you wanted to look more more at Augur, the kinds of things that we're working on right now are finishing up some of our Docker containerization updates and also adding API endpoints and if if you wanted, we could set up some time to go through that in more depth if you're interested in contributing to one or the other. But if you wanted to explore each project and decide which one you're most interested in contributing to, uh, we could do that too. It's kind of up to you, Doreen. You have two of them, I guess, the Dash Plotly and the Flask Ogre. Yes, yeah? yes. They work together. That's what yeah, they are interesting to me, both of them. I've been working with Django, but I can also, I shortly had an introduction to Flask and then Dash, uh, Dash also is okay. There's a project I did with Dash just once, was getting an intro to Dash. And since it's Python, I'm okay with that because once you have the knowledge of Python, at least you can easily get through other things, easily to manage other things. So maybe we can talk index about this. How is your schedule so that you can talk in the index about this? How to go about it? Um. So I mean, the first thing I would do is uh. So if you've worked in Django, the Dash Plotly framework is certainly going to be more familiar to you in terms of the kinds of things that you develop, um, than than Flask, um. The Dash Plotly, the one that I did, only was a data analysis project. So I was using Pandas, then I just used Plotly for my visualization. Dash. Yeah. Uh, so do you, so, do you want to take some time and explore each project and talk on Slack about where you run into trouble? Yes, I can take some time to explore each project. That's I need to familiarize myself with it also. Yeah, I need to do that. Yeah, and then um, once you kind of get a sense of which one seems to suit you more, we, we can talk over Slack and uh, set up some individual time to talk through contributing, maybe get you started. Okay, and then uh, with each project, when I check, I can see the issues are there, they're posted there. That's right. Uh, uh, for each project repo. I'll just get the issues I see and then I'll have to go through the documentation. Okay, I can go through them. This uh, week I can go through everything. I just explore them. Awesome. That's exciting. So what is that 4 p.m. 2nd November? Uh, that was the previous meeting that we took notes. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, we started the we started the cadence. Uh, for we had two sessions before. Before um, you had two sessions today. Yeah. No, two set. We had two sessions before the ChaosCon week, and then so last week we didn't okay. have one, or I wasn't able to be here for it. So there was only this is only like our fourth time trying this time slot, and we're basically doing this time slot every every uh every week no every oh. this is this is wrong this is old every okay month. so yeah. communication is mostly done via slack in case of any changes one wants to contribute we contribute to this we post our changes on on what we want to work on on the other group of slack yes yes exactly Okay, so I think we shall, I'll have to go through the repos. Uh, I've just taken a screenshot. I'm now on my phone. I've taken a screenshot of this thing. So I can, um, I can get the link. Yeah, I'll put a message 
in are you, the on Slack. Yeah. On and, Slack. Yep. Yeah, I'll put a message on the eight knot auger. Um yeah, that one would be really helpful. At least I'll go when I go back home, I'll have to go through everything then I see how I get started. This is a nice project. I'm glad you're looking, working with Python. I've always loved working with Python. I thought you were using JavaScript. It's good you're using Python. Yeah. It's good to have another we Python. We like Python too. <laughs> we're fond of it. Okay, so... Okay, so you'll just post on Slack, then I'll follow up on that. Yep, I shared the notes on Slack, so that should be easy to find. With the link to the repo. Exactly. Okay, thank you very much. All right. What's thank your name, please? I'm Sean. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't... Sometimes when I log in as Chaos, I forget to change my name <laughs> for the Chaos Community. Um, yeah, I'm Okay. Sean. You're yeah. Sean. Okay. Pleasure to meet you, Sean. Nice to meet you, Doreen. And whenever I'm okay. sharing, I can't seem to find the change name part either. So uh, too late now. Yeah, I'm Sean Goggins. I just posted in Slack. So thank you. So the next session will be on Monday, same time, like one hour before now. Yep. At exactly 9 a.m. your time. Every time this Monday. Every every Monday this time is probably the right way to say that. Okay, thank you very much. I have to be active now. Asante. Oh, thank you. Thanks, <laughs> right, uh, Welcome, Doreen. Thanks welcome. for coming. Okay. So, um, anything else that anyone wants to bring up while we're here? All right. I will... Hi, oh. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I guess right. leave the call. Can, um, can you hear me? I can. Oh my! Um, I was looking for my mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I this is just like not part of the meeting, but um, I hope you're able to like log into the server and try to create the account so that um, we could get working on uh, um, some of the stuff related to OSS Campus. Uh, oh yeah. Week. Yeah. Why don't yeah? Well, well, why don't we uh, end this meeting, Enoch, and then you and I can. Uh... I can connect with you right after this on my on my select on my Zoom channel. So okay, okay. How about like uh yeah, give me like ten minutes. And, no uh, problem, no problem. You could um send me a notification. All right. Well, it looks like uh, Peeb has requested my time at ten. But yeah, why don't we meet up at uh? I'll just send you a link. We could talk real quick. Yeah, sure. I, I'm I'm sure it won't take long. All right. Catch you later. Bye. Sure.